Hello and welcome to Dear Franny. I'm your host, Francesca Hoagie. I'm a recovered lawyer turned love and life coach. And this podcast is the place where I talk all things love and true love from dating and relationships to manifesting a life that you love. Thank you for being here. Hey, everyone. Okay, so this is a special episode today. I am sharing with you an interview that I did with my friend Bryce Isaiah for his podcast, The Purple Pants Podcast. Bryce is an amazing, warm-hearted, just incredible human being who I know through our Survivor connection. I don't know if you, if you listen to the show, you might know that I was on the TV show Survivor. So was Bryce. And even though we weren't on the same season, we still know each other and became friends. And he's just someone that I adore. I've had him on this show in the past, one of my favorite episodes ever. He's hilarious and just wonderful. So I thought it would be great to take advantage of the fact that I got to sit down with my friend Bryce and record this interview with him for his podcast to share it here on Dear Franny. So enjoy and thanks for listening. And we are back for a very special episode uh, this week. I'm so excited. If you are an OG Purple Pants Posse member, then you should know that you every year around this time, we get to have the amazing, the incomparable, the loving, the nurturing, the beautiful, someone that I get to call my friend. She is a love guru. Okay. She is a, y'all know, fix my life and now I'm going to kill her, butcher her name, Yama. Okay. This is get my life together. I just want to welcome back to the podcast, my friend, Francesca Hoagie. Hi, Bryce. I have the biggest smile on my face. That was the best introduction ever. I receive it all. I am so happy to have you back on the podcast. You know, this is an annual thing for us. You know, we're a couple of months late, but listen, life be life in. You know what I'm saying? And everything is perfect timing in the end. It truly is. And I feel like there is no better time to talk to you about just so much uh, that is going on. And before we even get into all of that, I want to like check in with you. How are you? First of all, we've seen the TED Talk. Okay, my sis was a a TED Talk. Can you talk us through your TED Talk? Oh, my God. Yeah, that was that was wild. That was really amazing and fun. Um, It'll be out in a couple of months, so everyone will get to see it. But um, yeah, I, you know, I've, I had a, is a long-term man- manifestation, um, because I decided I went to my first Ted event like seven years ago and I was like, I want to do a Ted talk. Mm. I'm going to do a Ted talk one day. I don't know how I'm going to get on that stage, but I'm gonna do a Ted talk one day. And I really just made that decision and really just held that just knowing like, cause it's not like something that you can make happen, you know, like it's not, it's just something that life kind of has to take you there. Mm. And so I just had this long-term faith that like life was going to take me there. Um, And then it did. (laughs) And so um, it was, it was great. I got to talk about my vision for a better romantic future that includes everyone and excludes no one. Mm. Um, And, you know, I, I actually like, really pinch myself and I'm like, I got to go up there and talk about self-love and transcendence and the fairy tale industrial complex and mm. true love. Like I just got to like mm. just I call it my franifesto. Yeah. <laughs> I just got to go up there <laughs> and give my franifesto about love. And yeah, I just feel so grateful for that opportunity. And it was yeah. very well received. So um I'm excited for people to see it. And and that is one thing, like when my TED Talk comes out, I'm going to be like, all right, everybody, I know I don't ask for much. Listen. But now I'm asking everyone to watch this like 25 times a day. <laughs> <laughs> Every day uh, for the next two years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. That is, uh, I'm so excited. And when I saw you post about it, I was just like, oh my God, like, look at you just doing such amazing things. And again, I always say that you are such a, a role model to me in the sense of clearly I got to watch you play Survivor. That's our connection. Uh, but just, I felt like everything outside of Survivor, everything in which you do uh, is just so amazing. And I feel like you are so humble about it. And 
there's like this saying where it's like, let your work speak for you. Don't speak for your work. You are truly the definition of that. Like you are just very low key. You don't say too much. You don't do too much. You don't pop out at too many events, but you know when Bryce is in LA and I say, Franny, can you come to LA? You show up for your baby boy. Um, but you, honestly, you just let your work speak for itself. And I just think that that is just like so inspiring to someone like me. Oh, thank you. I that's I mean, honestly, that is a wonderful, wonderful compliment. And I thank you and I receive it. And, you know, I feel the same way about you. I mean, we you know what this and this is I think we might have talked about this a few years ago on on the podcast. But I think one thing that you and I definitely have in common, and we have lots of things in common. But one thing is that we both know who we are. Mm. And we stay in our we stay in that Mm. like, no matter what. And so that in, and, and just, and who we are is just like, yeah, like there's a time to be, you know, out and pop it. And there's a time to be chilling. Yeah. <laughs> and we, and we know that. <laughs> and so it's like, I'm just, I'm chilling right now. Like that, that's what I, I need to be doing right now. <laughs> you know, that's what feels good. And I think, and I'm still me, I'm still me in every version of that. And so I think that's probably what you're picking up on. And you got that same thing, babe. I, well, I appreciate that uh, so much. And I feel like that it has been somewhat of a theme in my life uh, recently where I have uh, an eclectic group of friends. And as I get older, something that I shouldn't say I struggle with, but it's like friendships are a full time job. <laughs> I don't certainly can be. Yes. I like in the sense of like they it's work. Right. You know, I am in my thirties now. A lot. My friends are in their thirties. They are in relationships. They have children. And it really kind of sort of you have to make effort to make time for your friends. And I am a person where, you know, friends are everything to me, but also I like to chill. I like to be by myself. And I I really have set this boundary. And I used to feel so bad about it. But, you know, if I do events with like Wendell, with Bryson Wynn Present, and I truly give myself at all of those events. And when I come back from those events, like I need two to three days just to like recaliber. Yes. Listen. Oh, Oh, I know. I know. I can't. I can't do it. I just can't do it. I mean, like when I, so last time, you know, you had your event in LA, I came just because it was you. I was like, I can't believe I'm going, but this is because I love Bryce. Oh. <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> Everyone like all the wine and cheese, like, you know, New York survivors, because our text is live literally every day. I'm like more in touch with them than anyone. Um, <laughs> yes, other than, wine and cheese. Hey, other, Eliza. Uh, yeah, shout out to Eliza and Courtney and Steven and Charlie and Brian. Um, yeah, so that that text is is live. Um, but there everyone's like, I'm like, because Bryce invited me. I'm like, oh, okay, that's right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so <you go. laughs> I was but I'm the same way. It's 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 literally so exhausting to me. Even Ted, you talk about Ted. I left Ted a day early mm. because I was like, I just I'm too tired. I can't. It's so much stimulation and so many people, and it's a beautiful experience. But I was like, nope, I gotta go home. I gotta sleep in my own bed. And um, yeah, but friends and 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 finding that balance with friendship, I really re- I so relate to this struggle, right? It's like I say this all the time. There's so many people who I love who I never see. Mm. It's because tr- when. Right. <laughs> right. And it's like, I want to take the time for myself. And I've really been so present. And so I made it a point that I'm going to set clear boundaries. And although I haven't seen you in a while and I might be in town and I would love to get together with you, but honestly, like my bed is calling me, my peace is calling me. And I am, I'm working on this, but I'm working on feeling okay about that. Like, I know I want to see you. I know I want to cut up. I know, but I also know that like, I, I know what's ahead of me and I really need this time to just rest and some my friends like oh you a grandmom you in the house i'm like unfortunately i am <laughs> yes <laughs> and, <laughs> unfortunately, and grandma is so happy right now right <laughs> 
Yeah. And so really finding that balance of going out, making time and not just going out, but like just doing things with other people. And then also realizing that, Hey, like this is something that I like to do. I like to be by myself and not, you know, too much of something is never good. So I don't want to be by myself too much, but I also just have to realize like, listen, I just need a break. And I have been setting really clear boundaries with a lot of my friends and it's been working, but I do feel like this guilt of like, oh, life is passing me by. I'm missing things. I'm not, but I try to keep in the mind frame of like, what is for me is for me. And so like the experience that we'll have together when we have it will be amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you could, otherwise you'll run yourself ragged and, and, and that doesn't do anybody any good. That doesn't do you any good. That doesn't do your friends any good. I mean, I, look, I know sometimes I do need to push myself. Right. Right. So you have to kind of do that balance of like, okay, no, I actually, I need to go to this thing and I'll be really happy when I do. Right. (laughs) Versus because home is always going to feel like a good option. Always. (laughs) (laughs) The main option. There's literally like nothing that's going to be like, like, I'm so like, I have, I have negative FOMO, you know, for things <laughs> like going on in the world. And people will be like, oh my God, but it's so fun. I'm like, I'm sure it was. And first of all, it's not as fun as it would have been if I was there. So you know, right. I'm like, I am, I am fun. I am fun at home with my boyfriend and my dog on the sofa watching Netflix. I am so fun doing that. <laughs> um, but actually, wait, really quick, because I realized when I was saying shouting out the wine and cheese, I don't know if I shouted out Sh- Sophie, Sophie Clark. Yeah. Yeah, shout out to Sophie. I love you, Sophie. And she just had a birthday. Shout Sorry out if I be no worries. Yes. And shout out to Bobby, her husband. I uh, oh, I yeah. love them. I just and their I, kids are and so beautiful. beautiful. Oh my god. Oh my god. I literally just had the opportunity to finally meet Bobby in person in Boston. And um, I just love Sophie and love Bobby. And uh Bobby is always trying to hook me up with some of his friends and it's, oh i love it like continue, that's so bobby. Sweet. Yes. yes bobby oh my god i love that yeah they're such a great couple their kids are so beautiful and um i'm so happy you know sophie is one of the is one of the few people who won survivor who really just is winning at life yes like has it all uh yeah. in the sense of like in my opinion complete love family in your own space and yes. their career some, ca- career yeah and, and there's something that uh resonates with me with Sophie is that like I feel like I am such an awkward soul energy and I I feel like Sophie matches my energy and that like where I think people see this big bubbly personality of mine but Really, I'm just such an awkward, like, just unique soul. And I think that uh, Sophie reminds me so much of that soul that's just like, you're yourself. You're the you're that person. And I just love that about Sophie. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Oh, I love this. I love this. <laughs> so real quick, like, back to finding that balance of, like, life and f- your time. Yeah. So I just went to Beyonce, her first uh, stop in North America on the Renaissance World Tour. And you were uh, there. And I was there. And it was such a, I don't even know how to explain it, right? Because I've been a huge fan of Destiny's Child since I was a young queer black boy, mm. just trying to figure out myself, right? Yes. And I have gone through the trials and tribulations of life. And I feel like Destiny's Child, Beyonce, has really been a soundtrack. Now, I don't get into every album ain't my favorite album, but you know, like I just appreciate who Beyonce is and what mm-hmm. she has done for the culture. And last night watching the show, it was just a phenomenal show. But the one thing that I took to heart or noticed the most was that like, it's a three hour show. And I remember going into it like, Oh my God, Beyonce still out here for three hours. And it was <laughs> like, I felt, Felt like the spirit of work smarter, not harder, right? Ooh. Where there is, this stage is huge. I mean, Franny, girl, I could walk two seconds on the stage and be out of breath. Like, I'm like, (laughs) oh my God, like, 
how is Beyonce doing all of this? And for me, just the evolution of her. And it's like, of course she killed it. Of course she was dancing down. Of course she was just everything. But I felt like it was in such a smart way. Like the production screens are so huge. There was like a main stage in which she kind of sort of stayed in. Um, and then she would walk the runway and then come back. But like the dancers were all over the stage. I, I just felt like Beyonce was like, I'm going to be up here for three hours, but I'm going to make this work for me. Mm-hmm. And I'm not going to be running around this stage for right. three hours. Like, I got something to prove to you. Right. <laughs> I've done it already. Yes. I, like, And I don't know why that for me was just like, I was like, I... I feel that spirit like yes. and it, it still was an amazing show and I know I'm all over the place because it's just you know that's just my spirit but I I feel like sometimes we chase things like oh I, I need to stay you for I need to stay this and I need to stay that but actually it's like girl stay in your lane yeah and just uh, the Beyonce show was just amazing. I just, I don't know, I could go on and oh. on and on. Well, I love that observation too. Like, I mean, I haven't heard anybody else say that. I, and I, you know, I know a lot of people who, I know a lot of people who were going to Europe just to go see Beyonce. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, and everyone, you know, is raving about the show, but I haven't heard anyone make that observation, but I, from from your perspective and I really love and appreciate that and that is my that is like my whole energy for my life you know like work work smarter not harder like just because I I just don't have a ton of some people can just push themselves and they can just push themselves and they can just go and they can go and they can grind and like god bless those people I have literally never been that person even when I was a teenager I would be like, all right, it's nine o'clock. I'm tired. I'm going to bed. You know, my friends would be like, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, uh, I'm tired. I'm sleepy. It's bedtime. Right. <laughs> so like, I, I don't, I can't be running around in this world trying to please everyone because there will literally be nothing left for me. Uh, nothing. That is, that's the story of my life. Yeah. <laughs> because yeah. it's like, you do want to please everyone or you do want to validate people and make them but it, it, then it's like well what are you leaving for yourself yeah yeah and so again it, it's a balancing act for me but i feel i felt like last night i got the confirmation from the queen b uh that put on this epic am- amazing show like i really feel like in 20 years i will say to people i was at that show like i just feel like it's just mm. one of those iconic shows and I then relate it to my life for it. And it's like, well, when and where will I give my iconic show? Like, you know, I don't know. It's just yeah. like a work. Yes. Working towards something. Mm-hmm. And I guess my first real deep dive for you is um, what is your advice to people out there that don't know necessarily like what they want to do because I feel like we live in a society where it's like oh you have to have these goals you have to have these dreams and like you have to work towards it and you know the people that are willing to put in the work but like they still are just trying to figure out what is for me like what is my purpose what is like how would you help someone navigate that space yeah yes no the great 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 question um I mean I think, as you know, I was in that space for a long time. So I I know the pain of being in that space. Um, And the first thing I would say to anyone in that space is to not, don't, just know it's not going to be one perfect little answer that you can put in a box and put a bow on it. Because if it was like in terms of career, like if there was like one, I mean, unless you just haven't had a lot of exposure maybe to lots of different kinds of jobs and industries. And so maybe you just don't even, there are things out there that you would love to do that would light you up that you just don't know exist yet. But if you are somebody who really has been, you know, thinking about this, exploring this, you know, looking, okay, what do I want? What are my talents? What are my gifts? How, where do I go from here? Then I would just encourage you to embrace the fact that it's it's not going to, the answer is not going to come back like lawyer. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's going to be something, <laughs> it's going to be something that's different and it's going to be something that might not exist yet. And you might have to, to create that for yourself. Wow. I mean, that's the world that 
um, I think we're just moving towards just in general, because, you know, there was a time people would get a job and they would work for that company their whole career and then they oh. would retire and they have a pension. And that was, that was life. Good for them. Right. <laughs> right. But like now, you know, there isn't such a thing as job security. You know what I'm saying? Like there isn't just because we just live in this world that's everything is changing so quickly and technology and, you know, every it's so you really have to figure out a way to be self-sustaining in my opinion. Right. And that's, but that's not, but I think that's an opportunity because then it's like, all right, well now I don't have to fit in somebody else's box and have some job that I maybe hate, but I feel like, well, what else am I going to do? Cause now I get to say, well, what are, what does light me up? Right. What, what, cause even if you don't know the exact answer, there are elements that, you know, actually this is, this is um survivor related. So after my second season, after Caramoan, you know, if you're listening to this podcast, you know, it did not go well. <laughs> and and um, so Dr. Liza, who you know, yes, who's the survivor psychologist, shout out to Dr. Liza. Um, Dr. Liza and I had a, you know, we had a talk the day after at Ponderosa. And she was like, and I was in this place at that time. That's why I ever even was open to going on Survivor because I was like, I don't really know what I'm going to do with my life and this will shake things up. Like that was like why I was open to even going on survivor. Um, and it just so happened, like my first season and my second season were both in this like four year period where I was very much like, I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> um, but anyway, so after, so she was like, well, you know, we're talking about future or whatever. And she's like, well, wh where do you want to be in five years? And I'm like, I wish I could answer that question. And she said, well, no, don't, there are pieces of it. Like, what are some of the things? And I'm like, okay, well, I think I would really love to work for myself mm -hmm. because I, you know, being, you know, being in an office, I know having bought, I've done that. I know that's like, that's soul crushing to me. Not that it is to everyone, but for me, I know I don't want to do that. I don't want to be on anybody else's time schedule. I want to be able to like call the shots. So I know I really want to lean hard into entrepreneurship. Okay, great. Um, what else? I'm like, well, I know that I, similar to the whole like office thing, I don't want to have a physical space where I work. I don't want to have to be somewhere mm -hmm. physically. I know that. So there were just like these different elements. And I was like, and I know that I want to work with people and I want to help them and I want to do something that's important, but I don't know what that is. You know, so it was like, there were just like these pieces. So then- you know, so that's the first thing I would just recommend that people just feel like, okay, well, what are the pieces that I do know? What are the things that I'm called yeah. to experience? What are the things that I know based on what's happened in the past or what's going on now? Well, I don't, well, this shit ain't it. <laughs> like, you know, because that's information. Right. No, it really <laughs> right? is. It is like, it's really good to know. Like if you have a, if you have a job that you hate, this is really good information. <laughs> okay. So now you're like, well, even if I don't know what my quote dream job is, I know this isn't it. And like, all right, well, what exactly are the elements of what you're doing right now that you don't like? And what are the elements of what you're doing right now that you do like? Because there's always something that, you know, because even if like, I mean, like I've had jobs, I mean, I've had so many jobs, so many jobs. And, you know, one thing that I like is I really like being behind a register. This is just an example. I really like being behind a register. Okay. So... <laughs> Because you get to like interact with people, but it's short right. and you're not, ha you don't have to run around because you get to be stationary. I just like a job behind a register. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm here for it. <laughs> <laughs> Things you learn. Um, but um, I haven't had one in a very, very long time. But back when I did have those kinds of jobs, and even if I was like, I maybe I don't I, I don't like this store or I don't like my boss or I you know I hate the customers or like I think these clothes or whatever I could at least be like but at least I like being behind the register right well why do I like being behind the register because I actually get to interact with people you know and but it's not over well you know so it's like right. what are the there, you know so there's always something in there there's always something if you're looking so I just encourage people to just look just get curious about those things in your life that are working and what's not working because they're both really valuable information. Um, and then even though like, you know, for you, Bryce, like you don't know the whole picture, 
But I'm sure there are certain things that stand out that you're just like, I really, it's like me and my TED talk. I didn't know how I was going to get on that stage. You know, like that, that stage there, there's like 150 talks at the TED conference annually every year. And they get over a hundred thousand applications for those slots. Wow. And most of the people are invited anyway. So it's not even like the, you know what I mean? So right. like, so the odds of getting on that stage are so small, <laughs> which is why I was like, I have to manifest this because oh. I can't, I can't make this happen. I just have to allow this to happen. But something in me feels very strongly like, yeah, I see myself on that stage. I'm going to be on that stage. And so I didn't know anything else but that. I just had that feeling. And so I'm sure that you have, there are just certain things that you have a feeling about. Do you agree? I would a thousand percent agree. Um, I feel like there are things that hold me back. Um, And specifically, like, being honest, like, self-doubt is just... That's just one. And two for me is like knowing when the time is to break that chain from corporate America. And Mm -hmm. like, cause I'm like you, I know what I'm doing right now. I know that I'm good at it. And there are aspects of what I do now that I love, but I know what I don't like and what I hate and what I do not want. Um, But I also am a very, like I was raised by a single mother who had four boys. And I just remember always seeing my mom work. And I remember my mom always having the bills paid, always having a roof over our head. And so there are some things that are like, ingrained into my mind that I need to work. I need to make sure that my light bill is covered. I need to make sure. And so like, for me, it's like, I am one foot in not knowing what I want to do, but one foot in exploring opportunities that could be very fruitful. We we don't know. And then I am one foot in the door of, let me get my pension. Let me, you know, (laughs) let me work these 60 years so I can get like, you know, and I am, I feel like not that I'm trapped, but I just, I, I get scared because it's like, I don't know. Yeah, it is scary. Yeah. I I can eat. I want to make sure I can provide a home for myself and my turtles. So, (laughs) (laughs) so, okay. So I, I totally, I totally hear you. Oh my gosh. So much to say. Um, so I, I think first of all, you, there's, there's just a baseline level of trust that you have to develop within yourself that like, you're going to figure things out. So like for me, like what I always said to myself is when I when I made the when I made the cut, I was like, I know I'm not going to end up on the street, and that's not no offense to anybody who ends up on the street. I just know that like I have enough resources that like that is never that's not going to happen to me. That's not going to happen. So like. <laughs> You know, like I will always figure out, I will always figure out how to roof, have a roof out over my head. And I just had that baseline level of trust in myself. It's like, all right, so then everything else will work out, you know? And so I think you have to just develop that baseline level of trust that you will, that you will be resourceful and you will figure things out. And as you have always done, right? And so looking to all of the things that you have been resourceful about and all the ways you have figured things out up until now is going to help you to have the confidence, like, because we can just take those things for granted in the past that we've done and how, what we've already, the ways in which we've already grown, the risks we've already taken, um, what we've already manifested. It's easy to kind of take that for granted because you're like, okay, moving on, you know, but think about like 10 years ago, if somebody had said, Hey, Bryce, let me give you a little snapshot of your life in 10 years. Like, what would you have thought about that? I honestly think that I would be amazed. You would be amazed. You would be like, holy shit, how did I do that? Right. It's a, uh, it puts things into perspective because you're absolutely right. Um, I feel like the way that I feel right now 
is similar to how I felt or how someone could feel 10 years ago, right? That that yearning or that that hunger. But actually, when you put it into perspective, like 10 years ago, I didn't have half of what I have now. And so it really... It's a, uh, I feel like you're finding me speechless because I never, <laughs> I never, I, I mean, I've thought about it, but when you actually like put it like that, it's like, wow, like, right. And it, I almost feel ungrateful. Like, do you know what the Bryce 10 years ago was going through? Like, and look where you at now. And uh, you need to, uh, I, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I, see, this is why you always try to get me that guy, that friend. <laughs> Girl, see, this is why. Okay, but no, but right, it's like it, it's uh, it's that trust, right? It's, that like yeah. you're speaking of, and it's like trust in yourself because like that Bryce of ten years ago trusted, and look where you are now. And so, looking ahead five two years, it's like. Whew, Trust, but yeah. whew, trust is scary. I mean, I can't lie. Like it is like it a, is. Mm. Listen, I I have had to just really um like okay, I'll just give it to you straight. Like I'm just gonna give it to you straight. If you want to have an extraordinary life, you have to be willing to take extraordinary mm. risk. Mm. And it's and it is an extraordinary risk to put yourself out there in the world and say, this is who I am and I'm not going to apologize. And I know the value that I bring. And I know that I can manifest amazing things for myself and watch me do it. Mm. Well, yeah. are, do most people have the fortitude to put themselves in that position? No shade to them. Everyone has a different path. I'm not saying everyone should do that because, and, th and that's, and this is, this is for me, I'm so, 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 I believe so strongly that everyone, we all have a purpose in this, on this planet. Most people are not living their purpose, mm. but everyone's purpose is vastly different. Some people's purpose is to, is to spend their entire lives studying one flower. Some people's purpose, <laughs> seriously, right? Like there are people who are just like, they are, you know, like I, like my boyfriend is a scientist, right? So like, I'm like exposed to this whole world of science and they're just people who's like, they literally just, they spend their whole career, you know, studying like one DNA sequence. That's all they do. It's like, and they are so, they love it. Like it lights them up. They wouldn't want to study anything else, you know? And then there are people who are meant to have all sorts of experiences. And there are people who are meant to, you know, help people with one part of their lives. And there are people who are meant to raise children. And that like everyone has something. And if we would all just honor who we really were and what we were called to do, mm -hmm. and that takes courage. So whether you're whether the thing that you're called to do is to be on a big stage or the thing that you're called to do is to, you know, write poetry and maybe no one else is ever going to read it. But that doesn't matter because that is such a meaningful part of your life and your artistic expression and your creative expression. You know, so like I, I want I, I want to just be clear because I'm not at all saying that because I know people are listening and everybody's in a dip, everyone's different. Right. <laughs> and everyone's so I am not saying that like you need to be willing to like da 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 on social media or like no no no. It's not about that because it looks different. But like what is that version for you? For you and me. We are clearly called to have a public life. Mm. Okay. Are we or are we not? We are. We are. So we can resist it. We can judge it. We can, you know, wish that it was different, but that's wasting a lot of energy and it doesn't change anything. <laughs> it doesn't change anything. <laughs> it just makes our lives harder. So yeah, it, it is scary, but that's why you give yourself, you take that time and, you know, you said you almost feel ungrateful and, and it, and it is in a way ungrateful not to, cause it's unloving towards yourself to not recognize all of the work that you've done and all of the growth and how far you've come. Yeah. It, you're absolutely a thousand percent a million percent uh right and 
I have grown and I know that other people within this time span have grown um, so much. And sometimes it's hard to see when you are in the place that you are today. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, and- you're in it and you're so ambitious. So you're always like on to the next, on to next. And that's great. But still, like, but when you when you do that, you rob yourself of gaining confidence because you get confidence and your faith gets stronger when you're like, oh, shit. Yep. I did this. I did that. Wow. That was hard. That was scary. Somehow I did it. Wow. I figured that out. Didn't know what I was going to do. But look, it all worked out like I'm so grateful. Then you're like, oh, shit. Okay, wait, I can trust me. I am supported. Like when I step out on faith, like the universe does step up and things do happen. Right. And so you can't, and then you can move forward stronger and more empowered because you're like recognized like, yeah, I'm not, I, I, I've actually got this. I have everything I need within me and I don't have to do it alone because the universe has my back. And that's why I'm able to do all the things that I'm, that I can do, that I have done and that I will do. I find that sometimes what prevents me from giving myself that credit and that confidence is that I don't want to be braggadocious. I don't want to make it seem like, oh, I'm like, you know, and it's actually like, no, like, girl, give yourself credit. But I, it's also like, um, people will give you a compliment, right? And I am one of those people that when, for instance, when Wendell and I travel the country and, you know, the world internationally, um, (laughs) and someone will come up to me and talk about the podcast and what it has meant to them. I don't know why it is so hard for me to receive it. Like when I mean like receive it, like, uh, trust me, I receive the love and I, I, but it is like so hard for me to allow my heart to be like, bitch, look to at really what you let have it done. In. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You accept it, but you don't really receive it. Yeah. It's so hard because it's yeah. like, I don't want to come off like, ah, ha, ha, ha. like, but also it's like, I, like, look what you have done. Like, look, look, you are in some place across the world that country and someone is coming up to you saying like you going off on your podcast or you, it meant something to me. And it is just hard for me to wrap my head around that at times. And so it's like, I struggle with receiving compliments and really like receiving them. Yes. Yes. Well, as um, my friend Amari Ice says, a compliment, or I'm sorry, love is the ultimate compliment. Mm. Love is the ultimate compliment, right? And so um, I always ask people this question, which you're answering, which is like, how, how well do you receive compliments? And a lot of people have resistance to receiving compliments. And I'm like, all right, well, if you want to have more love in your life, that's your first assignment is to start letting those compliments in. And you just say thank you and you breathe and you feel the discomfort and you send yourself the love, but you let it sit, you let it sit in, you let it sink in. Mm. That's, that's actually really important. And I know we're not talking about relationships right now, but for anyone who wants romantic partnership, if you can't receive a compliment, like get on it. Uh. I promise you (laughs) this is this, it is related. It might not seem related to you, but you can trust me. I've been doing this for 10 years. It's related. Um, the ability to take time for yourself and to prioritize your own self care and your own well being over, over others is related to an ability to receive love romantically and otherwise. The ability to give yourself credit for what you've accomplished and to be kind to yourself and to not beat yourself up and to be compassionate towards yourself is totally related to your romantic relationships and all of your relationships, but romantic relationships really trigger a lot of deep things. So Um, a lot of this stuff comes up. So just know that like, oh, if I, (laughs) even if, even if that's what motivates you, because honestly, that was part of my motivation to get my, like, finally get, figure out what self-love really was and why it was important and how to do it. I was like, okay, I actually want somebody to love me 
fully for who I am and to love me so much that they want to spend the rest of their lives with me. Mm. And if I want that, I'm going to have to get comfortable with loving myself that much. Mm. It's a good motivator. No, it it really (laughs) is. And it works. (laughs) And it segues me to if there is, if you had a checklist, right, to Mm. people all across the world, everyone that's listening, um, that are that say, why am I still single? Right? You know, like, <laughs> why am I still single? What, <laughs> what's the checklist you could provide <laughs> to the girl? Number one, does your breath smell? No, it's <laughs> kidding. <laughs> In the morning, sometimes, okay? In the morning, sometimes. Everyone's red smells in the morning. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was a joke, everyone. No, but I mean, I, now here's a random of a random of a random. Um, <laughs> now I don't know how we get here. When I am dating someone, right, this is one of my weird bracisms that I know if you're the one, and and maybe this is could go on the checklist as to why am I still single? <laughs> but if I find your morning breath enchanting, mm. I feel like that is a signal that okay, maybe I really am connected, or I do like this person because I have you know woken up to some morning breath that has made me lock the door and block the numbers and i have had some morning breath that like the mornings that i don't smell it i'm like where's this where my morning breath at but i mean i know that still so uh i don't know how we got here but uh (laughs) well i i'll I'll just tell you that as somebody who um you know has been in a couple of long-term relationships including my current one um i would say that it has less to do with their breath and has more to do with how you feel about them at the time. Mm -hmm. Because when you're feeling all lovey dovey and you're, you know, especially when you're falling for someone at the beginning, you're like, Oh, that's sweet breath. (laughs) (laughs) And after two years of a pandemic, (laughs) you might have a different opinion. Maybe, I don't know. Hypothetically, no, I was kidding. Take the trash <laughs> out, and I gotta smell this breath. You know what? <laughs> <laughs> but um, anyway, morning breath is a very small thing. It's very easy to handle. It's not a big deal. So, um, but that's this is hilarious. But okay, so back to the checklist. The checklist. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, number one, I would I would want people to ask themselves, wh- how do I think about love? So meaning like what, like what are literally, what are the thoughts that you have most often about love? Like when you think about love, when you think about dating, when you think about the possibility of dating, what do you think about? When you think about relationships, like what, how, what are you thinking about? And for some people, they're thinking a lot about regret or they're thinking a lot about scarcity or they're thinking a lot about, um, you know, whatever. Everyone is in a different place, right? I could give lots of examples, but the point is that just to even get the temperature of what your inner, inner mindset is around or inner mindset, what your mindset is around love, because how you think about love is going to dictate everything that comes next. So, um, and just paying attention even to like things like, um, you know, I think I probably shared this on the podcast before, but like I used to, based on an incident that happened when I was nine years old, I used to think that boys didn't like me. Okay. (laughs) And, um, I can't even remember the boy's name who made me think this, but anyway, um, which is crazy. I'm like, I can't remember his name, but I remember how he made me feel. And he made me feel like boys didn't like me. (laughs) Um, But anyway, and so I literally carried this belief into my adulthood. And it wasn't until one day I had this thought that boys didn't like me. And I was like, oh my God, wait a second. I've been thinking that for years. I've been thinking that for years. I'm like, shit, I'm still thinking that, aren't I? And it just to bring, and then after I realized it, then I started noticing like how often that thought was coming up. And I was like, wow, this is really, 
I, I was like fascinated by it. Honestly, I was like, this is fascinating, <laughs> right? Like I'm done with this. Like I'm done with this belief. I'm done with this story. And if that's not true, then what else could be true? Okay. Well, maybe it's true. Cause it, it's not that every boy likes me. Obviously that's not the case, but maybe that's, that's not the case for anyone. So who cares that there are people who don't like me? I just need to focus on the people who do. And that was like, a very small realization that was literally life-changing for me because then it just completely shifted my whole energy and my whole approach to dating because I just let go of a story that was disempowering. So if you find that most of the things that you're thinking about love are things that make you feel worse about love and what's possible for you, you got to do something about those thoughts because Otherwise, they are going to dictate your reality. I agree. And as I am on this, I call it a road to a better Bryce, I want to say, and probably because probably within the time of our last checking in with Franny, um, because if y'all listening, you know, Franny be giving me homework. Um, So (laughs) uh, I... And again, I feel like every time we talk, we talk up, we talk about similar topics. But it, I think it's just so interesting the nuance and how the topic is there, but the subject matter has shifted because our lives have shifted, right? Yes. And so, in a conversation that we had last, you you offered me a a similar question, and I really took it to heart, and I realized um, that my ideal of love um, comes from this fantasy that does not exist c- exist, or mm-hmm. is not for my life, right? And mm. I, I realize, and I mean this by no disrespect, but I also feel like on the journey to myself is that like the way that I have looked at love has been from like a white woman fairy tale story. It's the fairy tale industrial complex. Yes. It's been indoctrinating you your whole life. Yes. And yes. It wasn't made for you. Right. Or for me. Yeah. Or honestly for anyone, but you know, everyone gets screwed by it. <laughs> right. And, and it's like, you know, actually owning my truth that actually I'm a black gay man and yeah. I want to hear and see more stories of that. And over the, I would say like the past four years, um, I've really been working on growing my black queer community uh, because it's important to me because like we're so different, but our, I feel like our experience is so similar. And I, I'm the type of person that I ask questions. If I, I, I meet people, I see them. And when I see black queer men or people in relationships, I ask like, how, like, how do you guys meet? What do you like? Because mm. I have realized that like, I have been so judgy, so closed minded uh, to a lot of different things because it's like, you know, I was fed this story. I'm I, I'm walking down the street waiting for a man to catch me from a trip that I'm not about to trip. And, you know, <laughs> I'm looking up in his eyes and like, that's how I know that that's the one. But girl, yeah. that's literally what I have been waiting for. And it's yeah. like, hello, wake up. Yeah. yeah. And I also have realized an area in which that I struggle in, or not struggle in, but men will flirt with me and I won't even realize that they're flirting because it's Mm. like, I don't know what it looks like because again, I'm trying to walk down the the street to (laughs) trip. Well, and also you're not comfortable accepting compliments. Well, so the, on a subconscious level, when someone's flirting with you, you're you're not even allowing yourself to receive it. So so you're not even allowing yourself to notice it because if you noticed it, then you would be confronted with possibly receiving it, which goes back to one of the reasons why it may not seem like a big deal or unrelated if some, you know, German woman is like, you, your podcast has changed my life. You don't, and receiving that, you don't think that's related to your dating life, but it actually is. You see how read me, y'all? Okay. (laughs) (laughs) 
Okay. No, you're right. I mean, I, I don't, I am not putting up a fight. I, I can see the correlation. Um, yeah. What is your suggestion for the listeners, me, uh, <laughs> <laughs> to be more present, to actually be more present in your yeah. love and dating life? Yeah, I mean, I would just encourage. I would just encourage the listener to. <laughs> I would just encourage them to. Um, to treat it as an experiment. Like, all right, how can I, because if like, so if there are people who are listening who can relate to never, if you feel like, if you feel like no one ever flirts with you or you never notice when people are flirting with you or, you know, people say to you, like, did you see that person was flirting with you? And you're like, what? No, they weren't. If you're, if that, if you can relate to that, then here's a fun experiment. How can I start to see the evidence of what I've been missing, right? Like, how can I start to just be more, because literally just asking that question, setting that intention of just, okay, I'm ready to see, I see what I haven't been seeing. You're going to start to see things because now what all, all the things that you've been filtering out now you've set this intention. So you're now allowing some of those things to come in that you weren't seeing before. So starting with that intention is just, is just really powerful. And then just challenging yourself, just be like, all right, I'm going to go. Cause, because also one of the, one of the things that not being good at picking up on flirting signals indicates is that you yourself aren't good at flirting. And I don't say that as any shade to your listener, <laughs> <laughs> because I also used to be very terrible at flirting. I did not know how to flirt. And I thought, because just like you and the romantic comedies and all of the the programming that we get about how love is supposed to happen, I didn't think I needed to learn how to flirt because I thought it was the job of some man to see me and be like, oh, you're the one and then have this moment and then I'll be open and then all of this, right? So once I realized that's not going to happen, people who aren't creeps, actually and people who people who have open hearts and who are not creeps um generally are going to need some encouragement to to even approach you in that way mm. okay so because and it's not because they don't like it's some people think like i want somebody who's so confident they're going to come talk to me no matter what okay it is very a confident person who's like, oh, that person's attractive, but I can see they're not open. Psh, I'm, so I'm moving on. That's confidence, mm-hmm. right? The person who's like, oh, that person's closed off. So I'm going to go because they're a challenge and I'm going to try to chip away and like break down their defenses. That's what pickup artists do. That's what they teach you to do in the pickup artist community. You find the person who is not comfortable receiving the attention and that's the person who you give all the attention to uh. and they use all these tactics to like manipulate you. Right. So it's, it's um, actually, this is so, this is something that I have seen this so many times that I finally had to realize this for myself was like, you actually make yourself more of a mark for people who are seeking to manipulate you when you are closed off and you are thereby showing your lack of confidence. Uh. Right. And so it's scary to flirt, but it's not that big a deal. Once you just start realizing all it is, is just taking a moment, taking an action, saying something to make another person feel seen, special and acknowledged. That's the baseline. You don't, you can layer many things on top of that. You can layer, um, desirable, you can lay, which and desirable, like, like, okay, so you're you're a gay man, but you can still flirt with a woman. You can still be like, girl, you look amazing, right? Like you can still give her that moment of like acknowledgement and you're and you're letting her know, like, oh, you're hot. Like you're like you're you're letting her know that she's desirable. You're not saying, I desire you. You're just saying you're desirable. So that's another level of flirting. And then the, there's a, another level of flirting, which is like, I actually desire you. And so typically when we think of flirting, that's what we think of. We think of it's like some, it's like, okay, hey, big boy. We think it's like, (laughs) it's a come on, right? Right. So 
that overt st style of flirting is a style of flirting, but there are many styles of flirting. And for people who are just learning to how to flirt and get comfortable with flirting, don't worry. That's not, don't even worry about that. Like that's not, that's not, we're not, that's, that's actually the easiest thing to do, but it, because it gives you the, the most result in the short term, but it's not conducive for long-term um, relationship building, if that's what you're looking for. So don't worry about that over come on thing. Cause, cause sometimes you're not even going to know if you, somebody can be interesting to you, they can be intriguing, they can be attractive, but you don't even know yet if you want them because somebody could be sexy as hell and you talk to them for five minutes and you're like, all right, well, it was nice meeting you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's like, so we have to like not think that flirting is like, I'm, I'm coming on to you or it's a promise of anything. It's literally just like, there's a moment that we're having. Maybe this moment will grow into something more, but even if not, this moment in and of itself has value because I just gave this person the gift of letting them feel seen and special and acknowledged. So you do that with eye contact. You do that with smiling. You do that when you're actually, when you're talking to someone being present, like, you know, not having a phone, like just being there, just actually asking them questions that you care about the answer to, you know, like just forcing yourself to be present in a way that you're not used to doing. And the eye contact piece is always big. So just starting to practice that and not waiting until you see the one person that you find extra hot, you know, a week or a month. It's like, no, just start moving through the world that way. You're making eye contact with people. You're smiling. You're starting to just like let more, you're giving more out and you're, and by doing so you're letting more in. That's a, uh, an interesting perspective in the sense of, I don't think I, I looked at it like that. Like, even if you're, not interested in someone or just like keeping your head up and making eye contact and making that like you are opening your realm of possibilities yes. than just trying to get from point A to point B. And I mean, that's just being present. <laughs> like, I mean, I know that sounds so simple, but you yeah. know, the listeners are comprehending <laughs> uh, <laughs> what you're saying because I, they tell me that, you know, sometimes when, if they are moving through the subway, it's like, you know, let me just get here to there and let me not, you know, be present. So that is, we received. <laughs> yes. Well, listen, you, you this, I, I, I really embrace like all of those everyday moments. Those are the best times to practice this. Like being on the subway, that's the best time to practice this because you're not, because you're, you're not coming on to anyone. Right. Okay. So this is like, there's so you don't have to have that. Like, but what if I, if I accidentally smile, it's like, if you, if somebody, first of all, and when you, and when you do go through this exercise, if you're like, okay, I'm starting to like make eye contact with more people, you'll notice most people don't make eye contact. Right. Right. So a lot of times you're going to be like, especially in a subway situation, <laughs> you're going to be like, well, someone look at me. <laughs> just, I just need one person. I have an assignment. <laughs> I need one person to look at me. Right. Um, so sometimes, you know, so it's not like you're all of a sudden going to be like locking eyes with everyone because you're not, <laughs> you know, so it, but, but you just increase the you increase the opportunities to practice when you're in situations like that you know and then you do it and then you're like oh my gosh i like smiled at that person like all right i did that and they give yourself credit and you're like all right that wasn't that big a deal it wasn't that big of a fucking deal and then you're like all right i can do and then you just get more and more confident it's okay that i'm cursing right yeah uh, girl, of course it is come of course on. it is come on this ridiculous question can you edit that out <laughs> <laughs> You, as someone that has been in long-term relationships, when there is a point that re a relationships, no matter what relationship it is, if it's a job relationship, a, a romantic, a platonic, a friendship, work. Like, you know, it's not, you know, it, we're, we don't head into the sunset like the movies and then that's <laughs> life. Um, yeah. I know a lot of my listeners and friends are 
at times in points of their relationship where it's like, do I want to be in this relationship? Mm-hmm. Has Is this person the person that I started this relationship with? Mm-hmm. Um, is there a checklist for people that are like, is this relationship for me? Mm-hmm. So, you know, I think, okay, I am going to answer your question, but I will say that this is one of the reasons why... Um, I think being single, to be in a single, to be a single aware person who's ready to manifest love is such an amazing position to be in because a lot of people are in relationships that they manifested when they were in a totally different state in their lives, mindset and otherwise. And then they're like, oh, well, damn, I, I, I don't want this anymore a lot of people are in that position. I'm not the same person. I was willing to settle for so much less when I started this relationship that I am now. And sometimes you and your partner can get on the same page and your relationship can evolve to the next level. And sometimes you can't, and you've gone in two different directions and the, and to stay in the relationship would mean you really compromising yourself and your own integrity really because you know like your what the authentic well if you were living authentically as yourself you would not be in that relationship mm-hmm. now people have people are married people have kids it's complicated there's all sorts of so i'm not i do not work with couples for a reason mm-hmm. because i am not going to be the person who ever says to anyone you should end your relationship because that's not my business <laughs> like it's not my choice to say that My focus is on helping people to get into relationships where you have a foundation that's strong enough to weather the things that come on because you, you've already taken into account that it's not going to always be, uh, it's not always going to be, um, a fairy tale and life is going to life. And you think that's going to stop happening when you're in a relationship. Mm. (laughs) Now you got your life and their life lifing. (laughs) You know know what I'm saying? Yes. Like, like my boyfriend's dad is sick right now. Like Mm -hmm. this is affecting my life now, you know, like all of his family dynamics and his friendships and all of this, this all affects my life and mine, his, you know? And so you think that like things are just going to be simple once you mesh your life with someone else's like that's, you know, but so many people, because we've been sold this fantasy of love, it's like, oh, if you just find the perfect person, then you'll live happily ever after and everything will magically work out the biggest lie and the most irresponsible one, because what is more important than who we spend our lives with, especially when people are like procreating and having kids and all this is like, these are important decisions. And everyone has just told you to like, Oh, they're, they're cute. And they meet your height requirements. So yeah, you should marry them. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like what? So, you know, I can't tell anybody what to do you know, whether it's time to leave a relationship or not, that's something everyone needs to decide for themselves. But I do, um, like I said, I just really focus for people who are single to really be grateful for the opportunity to make, to make choices from a, with a level of awareness that if, if things had gone a different way in your love life, you might not have, because, if things had just kind of worked out with that person who you happened to be with 10 years ago, maybe you would have married that person. And I think about that. I think about like the, I mean, oh my God, I spent my whole twenties wanting this man. And I think about it now and I'm like, thank you God for knowing better (laughs) than I did. Because I can promise you that if I had gotten what I wanted back then, we would 100% be divorced. <laughs> There's no way. Unless I just said, I'm just, I'm just, unless I have just so drastically resigned myself to a life of bullshit. Right. And so <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard when people are in a relationship and it's tough, it's hard. And people who work with couples are doing God's work and I am not one of them. <laughs> <laughs> What's your thoughts on spinning the block? Like, you know how we said we've been indoctrinated with this fantasy that doesn't exist. Your thoughts on 
uh, if you, if it's meant to be and you let it go and it comes back, then it was meant to be. Yeah. I mean, that's always the case. You know, I mean, I, it, you know, the problem is that some people are like, okay, I'm going to let it go, but they're still holding on to like, but I hope da, 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 da. And I think if you're holding on to the hope, then that's a little harder. You really, ideally you would get to a place of surrender where it's just like, I, I want what's best for me. I want what's best for that person. And if, if that means that one day our lives come back together, then that I'm, I'm surrendered to whatever, if that's what's best for us. Otherwise, um, then it just becomes, you can just be too easily pining after someone and giving so much of your energy to something that's not being like, that's not really fruitful in your life. Um, but I, it absolutely is the case that sometimes it's a matter of timing and people break up and they get back together. And when they get back together, it's a beautiful thing. Absolutely. Um, but also it also depends on, and you have to know, and I'm talking to the listener, <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, what is, what is your pattern and why did you break up? Because did you break up because this person is disrespectful and controlling and, and now with time, you kind of forgot how disrespectful they were. And now they're, you know, they, they're giving you the full court press and they're laying it on thick and they're trying to get you back. Like, that's different. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, if you're getting back together with someone, why? What has actually changed? And if somebody has to convince you or try to like woo you into thinking things have changed, I would take that as a not great sign. But um, one of the happiest couples that I know, they're my they are the parents of my God kids. Mm -hmm. They were the first time that they were together. They were totally in love. He broke up with her and he was like, I I'm totally in love with you, but cause they were in college. And he said, but I am not ready to be with my wife. Like I feel I, I want to like have experiences on my own or whatever. And so they broke up and went their separate ways. And, you know, life brought them back together and now they've been, you know, married for like 30 years and so in love with each other. Um, so that can happen, but it doesn't, sometimes we're holding out hope that that's going to happen. And then we really just kind of get ourselves trapped in that, like wanting something that isn't actually good for us. So I have a two part question dating and actually, the process of dating, right? It's you have to make a, a conscious decision to do that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Can if you're going to, if you're going to date, but also you don't have to date, you don't have to quote unquote date to meet someone. So what do you mean exactly? When you say you have to make a conscious decision, anything can happen. I mean, you could be well, like not even thinking about love and meet bump into the love of your life on the right. corner. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because I feel like there are people that, feel pressure to uh, find a significant other, say parents getting older, say friends are in relationships and the listener is always the, <laughs> you know, the third mm -hmm. wheel, like, you know, and mm -hmm. so there is that pressure. Then there is the thing like, well, oh, you know, I would uh, love a significant other. Also there's career, there's, so I guess, um, is that normal? Oh, it's totally normal. Yeah. I mean, we live in a society where, well, first of all, and this is so outdated. I mean, um, but well, for most of human history, you know, people, by the time that they were our age, they were grandparents with like, you know, about to be great, you know, great grandparents because <laughs> people were mating in as, you know, basically once they came of age. Right. And so, that was most of human history. People were marrying as teenagers. Mm -hmm. um, but, and, but we go to modern history and, you know, that trend actually still continued for quite a long time. Um, and now we're at a place where people are, you know, the, the marriage age is going up and it's, people are not getting married as young as they used to. I mean, it used to be like, I think even like 30 years ago 
or 40 years ago, the average age of like women when they first got married is like 22 and like 24 for men, like really young, like crazy, like to for us now to think like, what? <laughs> like right. most people got married at that age? Cause, because we live in such a different world and such a different society. So the idea that like, you know, you could be considered an old maid at the age of 25, which you could have been in you know, the lifetime of your parents, <laughs> like it's pretty crazy. So a lot of it is just like, you have to recognize like where this comes from. Um, and you have to just like decolonize, you know, you just mm. got to like decolonize your thoughts about, well, what is this timetable that I'm putting myself on? You know, is this serving me? Is it empowering? Do it when I look at my life, did I want to get married when I was 22? Like what? Like, of course, you know, I mean, not some people do get married at 22. Maybe some people who are listening to this podcast, bless you. I wish you all the, all the happiness in the world. But for most of us, right? Like I think about myself at 22. I don't know about you, <laughs> but I didn't have any business making that type of commitment at that age. None. Right. And so uh, it makes sense that we are delaying the the times that we're committing. And it, it makes sense that a lot of people are like, I don't want to get married at all. It makes sense that a lot of people are like, I don't believe that um, I, I don't want to live my life with one partner forever. Like that makes sense to me. Life is changing very rapidly. Now, having said all that, I think that, you know, going back to your original like, question about like that intention, I believe that if you set an intention to have a romantic relationship and you are truly like embodying that energy of love and you are doing your part, which isn't a lot, but it's enough because <laughs> it takes, you know, the universe is doing most of the work, but managing ourselves is a full-time job, right? So you're doing your part to just, you know, to stay open to, um, to make sure that you are, you're taking action that's like actually in alignment with what you say that you want, right? So if you say that you want romantic partnership, but you never go on a date and you won't date, then like you're out of alignment. It's unlikely that's ever going to happen, right? Because you haven't taken, you haven't done your part. You haven't shown up. And so, but if you do that, if you set the intention and then you show up and you embody love, you inevitably will meet someone. Like it's, it's just like cause and effect. Like you can't, there's pe anyone who wants a relationship and doesn't have one. All you need to do is look at all of the things in your life that are actually blocking that love. You don't have to think about, I need to go out and search high and low. You just have to think about, I have to remove the obstacles that I put in the way, not my fault, inadvertently, inadvertently, subconsciously, what have you, doesn't matter. Everybody has a lot we have trauma, we have history, we have programming, we have a lot of, um, you know, just dysfunctional messaging in our culture around relationships. So we all got a lot to clear out. Um, and you don't have to be perfect. So it's not like, oh my God, I can't have one issue. I can't have one fear. No, thank God. <laughs> you don't have to be perfect. But the more you can just move in that direction of knowing that like love is your birthright, it's available to you. The fact that your heart is calling you to have that experience with another person, that's the evidence that it is available to you. Um, I mean, I'm a very spiritual person. I don't believe in a universe where some people get to feel love, feel the... Um, have the desire for a romantic partnership and they get to have it and other people do and just don't get to have it. Like it's not available to them. Like that doesn't, that doesn't make sense to my mind or my heart. <laughs> um, universal law is what it is. Love is, is the most abundant force. We all have limitless capacity for love inside of us. And we all know this because you've never worried about running out of love. You've never like, oh, wait, I can't give my love to this person because I got to save it for my mom. Like no one ever worries about running out of love because we all inherently know that we have an infinite fountain of it within us. So if every person on the planet has an infinite fountain of love within them, how can love be scarce? So it's not actually scarce, but how we think about it and what we believe about it, that's where all the scarcity comes in. So the more you can start to clear that away, the more you're like, oh, there's actually opportunities for love all around me. And I just, all I have to do is reach out and 
take him. It's available. Tell yes. me you are in a relationship with a scientist without telling me you're in a relationship with a scientist. Come on with the evidence, <laughs> giving us experiments. I'm like, who is this? Okay. <laughs> I, I'm, that's hilarious <laughs> i i love it um and i used to fall victim to uh the age thing like you know like, oh, i want to be a, a certain age and this but i as you know the more mature i get i always say to myself well damn when I was growing up, 30 ain't look like this. You know, you like know? 40 ain't look like this. Like, <laughs> sure it's, did like it. it's something in the water. It's something in the grease <laughs> that they frying the chicken because, like, <laughs> I, I can just distinctly remember, like, I, I don't know, 13, 12. And my uncle, like, had a 32nd birthday. And I was just like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. I'm just going to forgive little Bryce because he just didn't know. But like, I know we had I just, no idea, right? But <laughs> I I feel like, and again, maybe it's just our perception, but like uh, him and me, like worldly different. In yeah, I, I, you know, because listen, just think of what forty year old Bryce is going to think. What was Ooh. would have to say about this conversation? <laughs> Because I will tell you, this is the thing about aging. There, there are two options. We grow older or we die. Okay. So th those are the only options. <laughs> but there are that, no that, other options. That's coming from somebody that found the Benjamin Button juice, uh, Granny. <laughs> I seen your Twitter uh, where you posted your first survival photo and a photo of you recent. And it's like, no, what the hell? <laughs> What's she doing over there? Well, you know what I'm not doing is that I'm not, I'm not tripping about getting older. I embrace getting older. I'm like grateful. I'm just grateful because I know the, I know, listen, this, the fact that I, that my brother died like a week or two weeks shy of his 40th birthday. And he's my, he was my older brother. So uh, this was very formative. Like this is very, cause I was like, oh, you think 40 is old until somebody dies two weeks before they turn 40. And it's uh. the biggest tragedy ever. You're like, oh my God, they were so young. And if you are at an age where somebody would say, oh my God, like they're so young. And if basically if you're under 85, <laughs> people are going to say that when you die these days, you're young. And if you don't think you're young, just wait until five years from now and you'll be like, oh shit, I was young. Right. <laughs> and that truly is the truth because a listener that I knew at a point in time would not, you know, lie is such a harsh word. But it's the word. You know, but Words are words. They have meaning. Yes. They were lie, lie, lie about their age. About their age. And then it's like, well, oh, damn. It, it, you know, then you almost feel robbed of time because it's like you trying to live then when you're missing now. And yeah. then when you look back, then you didn't miss the past. So it's, it's the biggest waste of energy. It's the biggest waste of energy. And and because I am so, I'm such a manifester, as you know, and I do think so much about energy. I really am like so vigilant. I'm like, I am not giving my energy to bullshit because it actually has a negative impact on my life because it it now it diminishes my power to manifest things that I want because now I'm focused, I'm giving all this energy to something. Getting older, what 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 would I rather have? Would I rather die? Because these are the options. <laughs> so when you're mad about getting older, you're, this is, this is how futile it is. Right. And so it's like, I don't want to die. So maybe I should just be grateful that I'm not dead. And I should just know that I can either get old the hard way, which is resisting it and being mad about it all, every day and shooting my face up with all sorts of, you know, um, pesticides or whatever, <laughs> and putting a million filters on and trying to like do all these things to like stay young in people's or look young or whatever. It's like, what? Or I could just like let the light that is in me just shine. And honestly, that'll keep you younger than anything. 
just find find happiness within yourself and that is like well then you won't even care how you look because by the way i'm pretty i'm i'm decrepit like i'm i'm decrepit in plenty of ways okay so let me not say like i have not actually found the fountain of youth (laughs) but i'm like that's just life right everything everything changes Mm -hmm. and if i embrace getting older then i get to just enjoy my life versus like needlessly causing suffering like why would i just needlessly suffer by being mad about being alive and not dead it very it's true it's it's almost like the theme of this conversation is like it's the talk of being present like you know not yeah. resisting it and you know that eye contact, like, you know, making that eye contact with life and being present. um, It's just truly remarkable to have these conversations with you. Um, I feel like, you know, we don't talk uh, for periods of time and then we just jump right back into (laughs) the depth, the the depths of (laughs) the deep end of the pool of the ocean. And (laughs) Just like you started off, there are people in your life that you love that you don't you can't talk to all the time, but it's about making the most um, yes. and like truly showing up and being vulnerable uh, with someone because it truly can be life changing. Mm-hmm. I was excited when uh, the announcement came a couple of months ago that, you know, finally season five of the Dear <laughs> Franny podcast. OK, because I was voting on which images I thought was the best. And I'm like, all right, where are we at? Where are we at? Um, <laughs> So thank I am you. Happy. I am not as good as you. Oh, thank you though for being patient with me. Listen, we the end result is always worth it. And so, if someone has not checked out the Dear Franny podcast, what can they expect uh, from season five? Oh my goodness! Well, season five um, is in full swing, and um, you know, I'm really. I, I actually had a whole outline for the season, and I'm kind of following it, but I'm also just going with what. I hear people talking about, you know, there's always themes, right? That's coming up. And I'm like, ooh, we need, I need to talk about this on the podcast. Ooh, I need to talk about this on the podcast. Um, so yeah, I mean, um, this week's episode, what is this week's episode about? Um, but it was definitely one of those things that just came up. I was like, I'm gonna talk about this on the podcast. But um, oh my gosh, wait, I'm totally blanking on what on what it's about. Why can't I remember? Why can't uh, remember? What's your Wait relationship philosophy? Wait, oh my gosh, I'm sorry. Now I'm like, I'm, I now I want to f- remember what my. <laughs> I'm like, wait, let me go look at my. No, forget it. It'll be out tomorrow. Um, um. Oh, I'm sorry. This is what it was about. It's about dating isolation. That's what it is. Because mm. just the experience of dating can feel so isolating. And um, when you're in it and you're like, you feel like you're the only person who's going through things, you feel like you're the only person who's like had this experience or, um, you know, it's just so easy to feel like you're the only one, you know, or like it's going well for everybody else, but not you. Like, it's just so easy to feel that way. And so that's what I had been hearing people like had been coming up and I'm like, oh, I know that feeling of dating isolation. And so that's what the episode is about. That's why I was like, wait, this is like a significant topic. (laughs) Sorry. I was like, I'm not, I can't move on. I have to remember. Um, But uh, you know, you record it and then it goes out. I don't edit it. So I forgot. Anyway. um, (laughs) I know know how it go. You (laughs) trust me. (laughs) It's like, I record it. I put it in the cloud and then I don't think about it. Um, But um, you asked me then my relationship philosophy. Is yes, because yeah. I was saying I, that was a that was the last podcast uh, episode. Yes, one. yes, yes. So, um, thank you. You're such a good listener. Yes. Yeah, so I, I like so I just encourage people to think about like what is your relationship philosophy because, um, you know, dating advice, for instance, dating advice is not one size fits all because there's different advice that works for different philosophies. So for instance, if your dating philosophy or your relationship philosophy is that um, the, you know, in a heterosexual relationship, the man should be the head of the household, then that's, and make the major decisions. That is many people's relationship philosophy. If that's how you feel and that's the, that's, those are your relationship values. That's the relationship that you are choosing to manifest for yourself 
then you're going to date in a different way than if you believe that I believe what I believe, which is that relationships are a co-creation between two people and that they have to have in order to thrive, they need to have a healthy foundation of respect and intimacy and safety and commitment and joy and, um, and that you're partners in navigating your lives together and in this relationship that you're creating together. So my dating philosophy and approach is based on my relationship philosophy, right? And you might see other, you know, love coaches or whatever, and they have a totally different approach, but they also have a totally different philosophy. So understanding what your own philosophy is, is, um, is important because otherwise in dating, it's too easy to be like, all right, well, you know, you go back to the age thing. Are there people who are going to discriminate against, um, you, you at any age, right. You know, whatever it is, like, like, you know, I, I work a lot with people who are older than you. So they're like in their forties or in their fifties and that's, they get really, there's, that's a lot of concern about discrimination of, you know, age discrimination, especially for women. Um, because in general, most men want to date women who are younger, right? And so the women who are 50, they're like, I don't want to have to date a 70-year-old. I want to be able to date a 50-year-old, right? Um, and are there a plenty of 50-year-old men who don't, who will not date 50-year-old women? Yes, there are. There are. They absolutely exist. However, why give your energy to those men? Because right. do you want to be with somebody who doesn't want to be with you? Right. Do you want to be with somebody who's so close minded and they have such an image and they're like, whatever or that, you know, like it's just so we can just like save ourselves the trouble of focusing on who doesn't want you <laughs> and just focus on connecting with the people who do. And a lot of the time, things like age, when you're when you're concerned about that, it's you are making it a bigger deal than it would otherwise be. And you actually might now be manifesting your age being an issue with the people that you're dating because it is such an issue for you. That's another read. Okay. That's a okay. <laughs> <laughs> you should be reading me for self. Oh, no. Okay. I, yes. No. It's, no, it's, I, no. That was no. never an issue for me. And it was never an issue for me in dating. I never, ever had any man ever say anything about my age. I never felt like never. I never felt discreet. I never felt that. But because in my mind, I was like, what? I just want to date the people who want to date me. Right. That's it. That's all I care about. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm here for it. Uh, what <laughs> What is next for Francesca Hoagie? Oh, my gosh. Well, you can um, – I'll take some good vibes. I, um, I have a TV show that I created, and we're about to go out and oh. pitch that. Um, so I'm really excited about that. Um I have, um, I just finished my book proposal. And so um, my book is going to be going out soon. Um, my agent will be sending that out. So, you know, book deal, TV deal, you know, TED Talk. Yeah. I don't know. I I'm trying to, I'm, I'm getting back in shape now. I just started getting, I started practicing yoga again. So I'm back on my yoga mat. So I'm like, really challenging myself to just really stick with it. So I'm excited to get strong and limber again. Yeah. You know, I'm just, we're going to take a road trip. We take a road trip every year, me and my boyfriend and our dog. So we're going to drive up to Seattle. I mean, I'm looking forward to that. So yeah, just, you know, <laughs> love, living my best life. Love, love it. I feel like I started this podcast um, saying, how much of an inspiration you are to me. And I feel like I want to end the podcast. Like <laughs> all of the things in which like not a TV, not a book, not like, <laughs> like literally creating your lane of yourself, creating yeah. the lane in which that like staying in your lane yes. uh, respectfully, uh, uh, just truly an inspiration. Um, and so Congratulations on all of the exciting things ahead. Obviously, you thank know, I'm going to be you. there supporting and loving on you. And just truly, thank you so much for always taking the time to have these conversations with me. I know that the listener. Uh, <laughs> appreciates it, uh, I love the listener. <laughs> so much. Uh, and just thank you just for being amazing. And thank you for following your light because you following your light 
has helped me follow my light. And I am sure helping follow, helping others follow their own light. So I just want to just say thank you for always being a trailblazer. And just again, thank you for this episode. I think it's going to be super special as always. And it's just always uh, a key key to talk with my girl, Franny. (laughs) Thank you so much, Bryce. I love you. I appreciate you. I'm inspired by you. I just am so proud of you. You're so incredible. I love what you're doing in the world and I just want more of it. And if you got to keep your nine to five job for a while longer to feel that confidence and build up that base and to really make a a plan, not like you don't need a 20 year plan, but just like, okay, well, what's my six month plan? Or, you know, how much money do I need to make on my own if I'm going to, if I'm going to leave my job and just to get strategic about it, because you can manifest anything. Taking it in, looking at my microphone in the eye, breathing it. <laughs> just breathing, just breathing, and just receiving. Yes, and receiving. you got this. Yes. I appreciate and love you so much. Thank you, Franny. Thank you, honey. Thank you. All right, that's it. I hope that you enjoyed this conversation with my friend Bryce Isaiah. Please check him out. Please check out the Purple Pants podcast. He is Bryce Isaiah, B R I C E I Z Y. A H. Okay. And that is in the show notes. So please check him out. Again, you already heard what an incredible human he is. So hope you enjoyed this episode. Thank you so much. I will be back next week with a brand new episode of Dear Franny. Until then, be well wherever you are in the world. And thanks so much for listening. <laughs>